All right, so uh, I was blessed with the opportunity to speak on giving the last time I was here, and Pastor kind of as asked me to kind of go back and speak on giving, and I was like, there's only so many messages you can come up with on giving. Like, it's not like identity. I could pull anything out. Anyways, um, so, but I'm excited because God wants me to kind of recap. I really feel like I want to recap some of the points that were made, but I really want to go to, at one point, I talked a little bit about the concept of reaping and sowing, and I want to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, but first, what I want, what I feel like the Lord really wants to communicate today is that we would kind of wipe our um, mentality, our understanding of giving being um, some kind of a dictatorship. It's, it's some kind of a rule or some kind of a work or some kind of a law. And I really want us to embrace the grace of God, even in the idea of giving. Like, how is giving the graciousness of the kingdom? That invitation that we have to be a part of planting things for the kingdom. You understand God doesn't need us. Like, he doesn't need, a, he doesn't need our money right? He could do it all, but there's an invitation there to partner with him in the building of the things that he is doing. And and that's what I really want to get to is talking a lot about reaping and sowing. But before I do that, let's review the, the key verse, which was 2 Corinthians 9. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes, and a lot of passages there say give deliberately, with intention, with much purpose from his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. Because remember, God doesn't need us. If he can drop quail from the sky, if he can drop manna from the sky, he doesn't need us. So every commandment that is given, I I, I just kind of hesitate to even use that word because what I want you to think of is I want you to hear the word invitation. It's even like conviction. We hear a lot of that in the church. And I like to tell people that conviction is actually just an invitation. It's a loving place where God says, this is a spot where I'd like you to move forward. This is a spot where I'd like you to be set free. Will you partner with me in being set free in this area of your life? And so I really want us to understand that everything that God communicates to us through the word comes flowing out of a heart of love, compassion, and grace. And so it goes on and it says, For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So God is talking about the provision that he gives to us, that if I talked on Friday night, if God has called you to it, he's anointed you to see it through He's not a God who teases us. If he's invited you into ministry, you better know that he's already provided the resources, the time, the energy, the wisdom, the compassion, the love, the innovative strategies that are necessary. If God has called you to it, he's provided for it. But God invites us as a people of God to be a part of that provision for what each of us are called to. So I went over some principles that we learn because in every passage of scripture, we're learning more than just information. When we're reading scripture, we must learn to to really seek and discover the heart of God behind that passage. Example, we teach our children when they're six years old, you shouldn't lie because God says, do not lie one to another. Instead of saying, the Bible says, do not lie one to another. And what we learn from this is God is the essence of truth. And there's a beauty and there's a freedom in being able to walk in transparency and in honesty. You understand the difference there, right? One is a religious speaking and the other is an invitation into the understanding of God's grace and our design to walk like Christ. And I think we do the same thing with teenagers. We're like, don't have sex before marriage. Come on, that's what we do. And then if they slip up, oh my gosh, there's so much condemnation because they don't understand the graciousness and understanding that we serve a God that is pure and he is holy. He is untainted. He is faultless. And everything he does can be trusted. That's the essence of purity. That was all sidebar. But we learn learn about the principles of giving 
um, that we see based on scripture, but we learn about God's heart. So here are the principles that we talked about. One, God invites us, when God invites us to build, he provides. We read through Ezra chapter one. I would encourage you to go read through it. I'm not going to re-preach the same message. But we talk, it talks a lot about how there were people who came alongside them and encouraged them with silver and gold for the building. And that word encourage is the idea of strengthening your hands. And when we are building something, we, we need to be strengthened. And we need to be strengthened of heart, but we also need to be strengthened practically. I can't build something without the finances that are needed, with the people that are needed. So if you get a chance, go back and read Ezra chapter 1. I try and tell people, don't let me teach you. I'm going to say it again. Don't let, don't let teacher Byron teach you. Let him start a conversation that you finish in your closet with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Let me start a conversation that you finish with the Holy Spirit with the Word of God in your closet. So when I say something flippantly, like go back and read Ezra 1, a good studious disciple of the Lord is writing that down. No conviction in that. Invitation. Invitation. Principle two that we discussed was God provides more than enough. So God doesn't just provide enough. We see this principle all throughout scripture where there was a need and when God made the provision, there was always an abundance. He said, the Bible says in Psalm 23, he anoints my head and my cup overflows. When he fed the multitude, there were basketfuls left over. When he filled the boat of Peter in Luke chapter 5, there was so much fish, the boat began to sink. He was chunking it into the boats of those around him. He didn't just give just barely enough. In fact, the Old Testament is all about God moving people from the land of lack to the land of just enough to the land of more than enough. And a lot of us get stuck in the land of just enough, and we miss out on the more than enough. And, and the reason is because we don't understand that God's nature is abundance. It's not just that he gives abundantly, it's that he is abundance. He is the essence of abundance. So if I'm carrying the essence of abundance in me, my belly is swelling. That's the river of life that comes up flowing out of me. It's not just I'm getting fat and happy and keeping all these seeds for myself. But there's an abundance that comes up and flows out of me. Principle two was giving should be deliberate. It's a deliberate decision. Why? Because God is deliberate in everything he does. He was deliberate in your very creation in your mother's womb. The Bible says that while you were yet unformed, he saw you, he knew you. He chose you before the foundations of the earth. He is very intentional. He is very deliberate in everything that he does in our lives. He has a very deliberate plan for you, Faith. You are not an accident, and your plan is not a eeny, meeny, miny, mo. God was deliberate when he wove your personality around your purpose. And we learn from that that everything we do should be intentional. And I'm afraid that as a people of God... We're not doing life. Life is doing us. Can I just say that? Come on, how many of you are getting done by your finances? You're not doing your finances anymore. They're doing you. And God says, I have designed you to do life, to stand upon the earth, to, be, to have dominion, to subdue it, that you would walk in authority and you would be intentional about every decision that you make. I'm going to move on. Principle four is this. Giving is not a matter of the law, it's a matter of the spirit. Now, I gave a shocker of a message last time when I said the word tithing is actually only in the New Testament once, and it's actually when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees because they cared more about their tithe than they did about love and grace. But the tithing concept is an Old Testament concept. In the New Testament, he talks about being a cheerful, abundant giver, giving from the heart, and it's less about your 10% of your money. It's more about the 100% of your heart. So it's not a matter of law. It's a matter of spirit. So if I could just break the word tithing off of today's church, can we just do that? We just break it off of this church. Because we don't want money out of works. We don't want money out of the Old Testament. We don't want money out of law. We want money that's compelled by the Spirit of God. And it's possible you're limiting what God wants to do in you and through you because you have already predetermined that 10% is your tithe. And you're putting God in a box when you do that. Principle number five, provision is found in the hands of the people. And it's the idea that 
God entrusts to his people. When Jesus fed the multitude, he handed the two fish, the five loaves, to the disciples and said, you feed the people. Again, could quail have fallen from the sky? Absolutely. Could manna have fallen from the sky? Absolutely. But there was an invitation to partner with what God wanted to do, the provision. All right, so I talked a little bit after I gave those five principles. I talked a little bit about the things that keep us that keep us from giving the way God has designed us to give. And the first thing I talked about was the law of reaping and sowing and that we don't understand the law of reaping and sowing. I'm going to loop back to that, but let me tell you the second thing that we talked about. We talked about how fear, a lack of understanding, the fear that I don't think God is going to replenish what I just gave. And again, in that, we learn that we don't understand the character of God. You've got to understand how God works, and it makes it easy to do the things of the kingdom. And then we talked about um, our priorities, and we talked about Haggai and how they took all the goods and all the wood and all these things, and they did no longer used it to build the temple, but they built for themselves their own paneled houses, and how the prophet says to them over and over again, consider your ways. Go back and build the temple. And just that loss of priorities, which I would like to propose, is also that lack of deliberation. That we're not deliberate with the things that we're doing with God. So I want us to talk about the law of re- the principles of reaping and sowing a bit. I want you to think of sowing. I want you to think of giving as sowing. I want you to think of giving as investing. I want you to think of giving as planting, building. And I said last time, and I think a lot of times we're like, well, there goes my $10 out into the wind. And we have no idea what happens to it instead of recognizing, no, every dollar that you plant is a seed being sown into the kingdom. If we understand, if we understand the principles of sowing and reaping, then there's an excitement that comes into me and just says, that says, I don't have to sow, I get to sow. And I'm expecting a great return. I'm expecting a great return. This is true of everything that we do. Everything you do, every action you take, every decision you make, everything that comes forth from you is a seed that is released into the atmosphere. Every look that you give your child, come on, it impresses into them. Every curt remark that you make leaves an impression. It plants a seed. It causes something to happen in the atmosphere. So the first thing I want you to understand is Principle one is you reap what you sow. You reap, and if you could say what, if you're writing it down, put that what in capital letters. You reap what you sow. So if I sow corn, I'm going to reap corn. If I sow a peach seed, I'm going to reap peaches. Hopefully I will. But you reap what you sow. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. So every action, every decision, so I want to go beyond just understanding that your seed is a dollar. I want you to realize that there's more to a seed than just a dollar. There's your mouth is a seed. Your face is a seed. Your action is a seed. Your decisions are a seed. And one of the things we say to our residents who live in our housing program is every action you make is either an asset or it is a liability to who you are becoming in Christ. Every relationship you listen to me, young people, every relationship you have is either an asset or it is a liability to who God is wanting you to be in Christ. Every decision you make is either an asset or it is a liability to the path God has in mind for you. There is no in-between. See, the enemy wants us to think that there's this lukewarm space. And there is, and it's demonic. It's it's demonic. I mean, God, Jesus says in Revelation, those of you who are lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Because you were neither hot nor were you cold. In other words, you didn't have a work that was fruitful. You were just lukewarm. You were a faith without a work. So every action is an asset or a liability to who you are becoming. We must be deliberate. I like to take, again, I do this a lot of times with young people. I have 
two pots in my office, and one is one literal pots with just dirt. And one says flesh, and the other one says spirit. And so we'll talk about all the decisions they made that week, and I'll apply a seed. And I'll say, okay, this was the seed of did I study? This was the seed of, seed of uh, did I engage in sexual relations? Can we just have real conversations? Can we just have real conversations? Can we have real conversations in this? Okay. This is the seed of pornography. Come on, this is the seed of pot. Marijuana, did I smoke anymore? This is my vape right here. And so, and then we talk about the other things like, okay, so there were some assignments I gave you this week, like declaring this scripture. This is the seed of that scripture. But every action you make is a seed, and we begin to plant all the actions. And the pot of flesh has a bunch of thorns in it, a bunch of yuck, and this is a beautiful flower. And, we, and what I'm doing is I'm revealing to them that they are not a victim of their weeds. <laughs> I'm revealing to them that you are, sowing, you are reaping weeds because you sowed flesh, period. And that is not to condemn them. That is to empower them. It's to reveal to them that you have the authority to take up serpents in your hand. That you don't get to be controlled by the weeds of your life. You don't get, the weeds don't get to overtake you. You get to make de better decisions to cut the weeds out of your life and sow to the pot of spirit. So in, um, in Romans chapter 8, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit... Uh, they will reap the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we learn in here that there is a law of reaping and sowing. If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life and peace. That's a promise. Let, let me just do a real te quick teaching for you. I can take this passage, I can turn it into a declaration, say, today, I declare I'm going to sow to the Spirit. Therefore, tonight, I will feel an illumination of life and peace that I'm not feeling right now. Come on, I can declare that in my life. Because the Bible says it, I can declare it. I declare that as I sow to the Spirit today, that life and peace will be released into my heart and my mind. I declare that as I sow to the Spirit in my children's lives, that the Spirit of life and peace will be released in their life. So I'm not making up something to pray. I'm simply saying what God is saying to me, and I'm coming into an agreement with him. I'm declaring it, and I'm enforcing that truth in my life. So as I sow to the Spirit, I can expect what? Life and peace. I can expect it. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on the earth. The invitation. Set your mind on things above and not on the earth, and you will reap life and peace. Principle number two. So the first was we reap what we sow. If you're sowing to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh. If you're sowing to your spirit, you will reap of the spirit. You can expect it. Why are we shocked when crappy stuff comes our way, when we've been making crappy decisions? The Bible already tells us that's going to happen. If you sow poop, you're going to reap poop. That's as best as I can say it. All right, principle number two. We reap more than we sow. Here's where we start to really see the grace of the Lord. Because he'll take your little bit and he'll do much with it. But the Bible says if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, that's a very, very teeny tiny amount of, of faith. But he says if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, that's all you need. Go ahead and speak to the mountain and I'll move it. That's all you need. Hi, Daisy. That's all you need. And so he says, you can have faith this teeny tiny, you can have anything that is small, and I'm going to multiply it. You're going to bear more. Now, from a practical sense, we get it. I understand if I sow one kernel of corn seed, I'm going to get a whole stock. I'm going to get more corn seeds than I planted. We get it in the natural, but we don't have an expectation of it in the spirit we got to have that expectation. The Bible says this, Now may he who supplies the seed to the sower, the bread for food, supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. What is God saying here? He's saying, as, you, as he will supply you the seed and as you sow the seed. Remember the story of the men with the talents and one said, I just tucked it, I just tucked it and I hid it, I buried it. And he comes back and he says, you wicked, lazy servant. 
Because out of fear, you didn't sow, you did not invest, you did not plant, therefore you will not reap. Whereas the other men, there was a great reaping that happened. This is a biblical principle. Do we get it in, do we get it in our lives? Do I expect that for one single prayer that I'm praying over one person that multiple people in the room are receiving? Come on, let's just keep it real. Do I expect that out of one action in my life that is seemingly so small, maybe it's smiling to somebody, saying, how are you doing, that perhaps I could save their life? Perhaps they're having a bad day and God illuminates that person and just by making eye contact with them, they're like, somebody sees me, somebody recognizes me, somebody just smiled at me. It is possible you could save a life. See, the enemy wants you to think that everything you do is too small. When God is like, no, 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 no. Bring me your small and I'll increase it. I will bring much fruit from those things. So again, consider what we learn about God being a God of abundance. Our return in the spirit is great. Come on, I want somebody to say, my return in the spirit is great. You, know, you guys have heard the term ROI, right? Your return on your investment. We, those of us who own businesses, we are constantly discussed. We talk about a missional return as well in, in crazy ministries. Like, what is our missional return? So we try and measure our actual financial return, but we also try and measure our missional return. And typically, we can do one small thing, and the return is always bigger than what we invested. We can expect that. And if that isn't the case, then I know there's foul play in my ministry. Because that's what God says it should be. He says you should be able to make small actions, take small steps, and the return will be bigger than what you invested. We should expect that. That's what we should be expecting. Principle number three, we reap in proportion to which you sow. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now this sounds a little confusing because we reap more, but you also reap in proportion. Okay, so if I, if I sow two current corn kernels, I'm going to reap more, but I'm going to reap in proportion that I, reap, that I sowed two seeds instead of one. Now I've got two stalks of corn. You follow? So some of you are reaping sparingly in your life, and it might be because you're sowing sparingly. You want to know why? Because you have fear in your life, and you don't believe that God is abundant. You don't believe he's going to provide for you, point blank. You don't believe he's going to come through for you. You don't know. Come on, that's why they would, they would save up manna for the day. Day after day, God dropped manna, but still they would save some. Because they didn't understand the character of God. That God is our provider. Look, it, it, the Bible says it delights the Father to bless his children. Come on, somebody just needs to come. God, you are delighted to bless me today. He'll wake up in the morning and be like, girl, you are blessed because God is delighting in you. I mean, I can pray that with confidence. I'm not making up something to pray. Today, I will be blessed. Not because I've done everything right, but because it delights the Father. And so I'm just going to stand here and receive the blessings of the Lord. I'm going to do nothing, and I'm going to recognize the grace of God says I want to bless you. I'm not going to work for it. And I'm going to respond to that by sowing back into the kingdom. See, a lot of us are like, <gasps> I was, oh, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I better tuck that away. And we expect that God's not going to be the same God he was for us today, tomorrow. And we operate in fear. And we're like, just in case I lose my job. And I'm not saying that we don't have to make wise decisions and that God doesn't lead us down a path of wisdom. But I am saying that there's a very fine line between I'm just trying to be wise and be a good steward and fear. Very fine line. Very fine line. All right, I'm going to move on. The Bible says this in Luke 21. He, meaning Jesus, looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow woman putting in two mites. And he said to her, Truly I say that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all of these things you gave out of your abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. She put in all of her livelihood that she had. So this is the idea, again, that she's, going to, she's reaping in proportion. Like she has a small amount, but what she gives is proportionate to what she has. Okay, so some of us think it's a big deal that we, write, we stroke $10,000 checks. But if we looked at your income, I'd be like, uh, can we just be real? Because somebody's like, mm, well, $10,000 is a little more than 10%. 
but she just said that 10% might be limiting God. I'm just keeping it real. But if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Come on, we need to, we need to sow bigger. Can we just say that we need to sow bigger? We got to sow bigger because I trust God to provide. The Bible says that everything that you give, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put back into your bosom. So the same degree that you pour out will be poured back into you. And if God is a God of abundance, what can I expect? I'm going to get more back. So I can pour out on a Friday night for three hours. You know what I'm expecting while I'm sleeping? That I'm going to wake up filled with an abundance of joy, an abundance of energy, an abundance of, of love, an abundance of confidence, an abundance of... Because with the same degree that I poured out, I'm expecting that God will pour it back into me even greater. That's what happened with the woman, with the widow woman, when she was pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. With as many vessels as she has, as long as she poured out, there was a replenishing of the oil. It's the same concept here. All right, I'm going to move on. Next, we reap in a different season in which you sow. Now, this is where it gets hard. Because y'all be like, I've been doing that, and I ain't getting no reaping. I've been doing it. I've been doing it, Pastor Lisa. That's the least I've been doing it for two weeks. <laughs> Brad hates when I say this to him. Sometimes he'll be like fussy or frustrated because things aren't moving fast, even though he's super. And I'll be like, well, just a reminder, babe, that the Israelites wandered the wilderness for 40 years. And he's like, that is not encouraging. Not stop saying that, you know. But it's true. But the reality is the enemy knows he can wear you out. He wants you to give up. He wants you to stop whatever it is you're, you're sowing to. If you're sowing to the word of God, I ain't feeling nothing. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, The Chosen where he releases the baptism of the Holy Spirit into uh, his disciples. And they're like, has anybody seen that one? And they're like, we don't, we don't feel anything. And he's like, it's really not about a feeling. It's about a knowing right? And so a lot of times we're like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try it. When, people, when my clients are like, I'll try it. I'm like, no, we don't try. We, we are, you're not paying me to help you try. We don't try. We either do or we don't do. We're going to determine in advance. Either we do or we don't do. Oh, I tried it. I tried keto for two weeks. Two weeks I tried it. Did God tell you to do keto? I, I just thought he did, but now I see no result. And I don't know how to find a reward in the Lord. Come on. And instead, the world has taught us how to find our reward in the result. Come on, I'm going to say that again. I've never said that before. I'm going to say it again. The world has taught us that our reward is in the result and not in the Lord. So when I don't see a result, I quit. When the Bible says this, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will reap of the flesh. But if he sows to the spirit, the spirit will reap, he will reap everlasting life. And then it says this, but let us not grow weary while doing good. For in, come on, who can finish it? In due season, thank you, teacher. In due season, we will reap if you do not faint. In other words, if you don't give up, you will reap. But you want to know what happens is we don't reap because we give up. Because I ain't reaping fast enough. And we live in a microwave society, and we expect a quick return. Now, I'm going to tell you, I pray for a quick return every time because I know God can do it, and I don't like to wait. But I have predetermined in my mind, if there's no quick return, God, you said it until you tell me not to do it, I will keep doing it. Because when God said, let there be light, light continued. He doesn't wake up every day and go, let there be light again. Let me make a decision again. Let me make light again. Well, let me pray about it. Okay, I'll do light again. Oh, let me pray about it now. Okay, let me do light. You know what? My people don't notice the light. Maybe I should quit. There's no reward in the light. There's no result. So maybe I'll just quit making light. That's not God's, that's not his character. When he says it, it happens and it sustains. It sustains. Until he says, let there not be light, there will be light. And so if God says, this is what you're going to do, you have to predetermine, if I see nothing until you tell me to stop, I will continue. And we are a weak, we call it a, we become a snowflake society. And we give up and we miss out on the reaping because we give up too soon. We get faint hearted. We miss out on the blessings of reaping because we quit when we don't see the results. 
Instead, we should be looking for the reward of the Lord. In this, we must allow the Lord to take precedence in our life. That's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Seek first. Come on, we're seeking the result first. Well, it didn't work. What didn't work? God didn't work? Come on, let's just keep it real. Well, what were you expecting? Were you expecting the fruit of peace in life to come into your heart, or were you expecting your husband to change? Come on. <laughs> oh, I tried that. I tried that submissive thing for about three whole weeks, and he didn't change. Well, when God invites you to do something, it's not about the other people. It's about you. It's not about the outside. It's about what God is doing in your heart and in your life. And so when we're looking for the reward in the right place, which is seeking first the kingdom of God, then all of these things will be added unto you. So what things? What things will we reap? Let it be said that there is indeed a personal reaping when we experience from, that we will experience from sowing into our spirits. Many of us have experienced the fruit of peace because we've decided to set our mind on Jesus. Come on. We sowed to the presence of Jesus and we reaped peace. Many of us have sowed truths into our lives and we have felt the shift in our inner beings. Many of us have felt courage and confidence come rising up in us because we have set our mind on Christ. See, because as I sowed to Christ, I have felt the shift of that reaping on the inside. We've experienced the effects of our new creation in Christ as we have daily sowed to the scripture, which, by the way, the Bible says is an incorruptible seed that rescueth the soul. In other words, I can read scripture. Come on, anybody read scripture and you're like, I got nothing. I got nothing that felt so dry. Nobody, just me. Just me. All right, so I feel a lot, you know, like sometimes I'm like, I just feel like I've just read the same sentence five times. But if I understand that the Bible says that his word is an incorruptible seed that promises to bring an increase in my life, I'm like, I don't need to feel it. I don't need to know it. I don't need to see it. I just know it's happening. I'm going to declare it in my life. God, you say that as I sow your seed into my word, that you will bear much fruit in my life. So I'm going to keep on doing it. I don't care if I read the same sentence five times over and over again. I'm going to declare what is true, despite how I'm feeling, despite my reasoning, despite what I'm receiving, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it, and I'm never going to not do it because God's never going to tell me to stop doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. So the Bible says this, um, I already read this, about giving back to you. So that's the whole idea of every time we reap something, every time we sow something, we're going to reap it back. So if I'm sowing the word of God, I must expect. But Brad had a good conversation yesterday. He was like, have you ever thought, well, actually, he said it this way. So when you preach on giving, have you ever actually taken a look at the scientific physical? And I said, first of all, this is only the second time I've ever preached on giving, because only Pastor Scott. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was talking smack about you around the pool yesterday. But it was a good point. So I, I want us to actually talk, take a look for a moment about some of the actual physical effects from giving. Because I want to know what am I going to reap here? Huh? I want to know what the reward is. Come on, am I the only one? Like, I'm looking for outcomes in my life. I want to know. So from a scientific perspective, the Bible says this. Reacher shows that charitable giving delivers a host of benefits to the body and the brain. It lowers your blood pressure. I'm in. It lowers your stress level. I'm in. I'm all in. All right. Less anxiety and depression. Anybody? Anybody in? Cool. Come on. Let, let, me, let me back up in case you may. Wait, how do, I, how do I achieve less anxiety? By giving more charitably. Science is telling us this. Now, I just gave you lots of scriptures, truths that talk about the effects of giving. But even science, the science is actually getting caught up to what God said all along. Okay? Increased self-esteem. <laughs> what did he say? Yes. Increased self-esteem. Moreover, as a brain health coach, listen to this, it is known that br our brain's pleasure circuits are stimulated by the acts of charity and giving. In other words, our brain releases those feel-good endorphins, chemicals such as endorphins, which gives you a sense of euphoria. Anybody else in? It feels good to give. Anybody ever just give somebody a ridiculous tip and it just feels good? You do get like a rush from it, right? 
It releases oxytocin. It promotes tranquility and inner peace. In other words, it makes you happy. It makes you feel good. So this is what's so interesting. Of course, we all know that science is just falling into submission to how God designed us. And so I would like to propose to you that the invitation to give is actually good for your soul. It's part of God building your health. It's part of God, come on, this is where I'm talking about the grace of God, where we have to kind of shift and be like, my God isn't a God that's like, you need to give 10% every week or I will smite you. Instead, where God's like, hey, this is a part of you living a life that's healthy. This is a part of you living a life that's filled with joy. I want you to feel euphoria. Come on, he's not a mean God. He's not like, no, I don't want you to feel good. I want you to feel just right, but not good. No, he wants you. I don't know if God's voice sounds like that at all. <laughs> when I was in the Baptist church, that's what it sounded like. I'm just going to say that. It was like, oh, my God. <laughs> now it's more like this. Hey, baby. Anyways, sometimes it's more like this. Hey, baby. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I don't believe that God invites us to give because he needs us. He invites us to give because we need giving in our life. Because he knows it's the fulfillment of our design. That in fulfilling our design and bringing us more into his likeness, in maturing us, and the Bible says that he is not willing that we would be incomplete, but rather he is maturing us. Part of that process is that invitation and that response to giving. That there's a fulfillment of your design as you engage on a regular basis in giving. And you will feel that. You will feel that. I want to close with this. The Bible says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, I, in my book, I think it's Mastering Your Seasons, I wrote about a field full of flowers and the different ways that we view God and the invitations that he brings into our life. Now, I don't know about you, but I always read this verse, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Ugh. But in this field full of flowers, I want to tell you about three signs that were written in there. You can come on up if you want. One is written in German, and it said, picking the flowers is prohibited. And the other was written in English, and it said, please don't pick the flowers. But the third was written in French, and it said, if you love the flowers, then you won't pick them. And there's an opportunity in that story for us to really recognize, how do I view God? Do I see him as this dictator where I feel this fear or this sense of angst because I'm not giving, like oh, I'm supposed to be giving and I'm not giving my 10%? Or do I understand that God is saying to me, look, if you love me, if you love my kingdom, if you love my mission, if you love my work, if you love the work of the cross, if you're passionate about your life, if you're passionate about your love, if you're passionate about what you do, then you would go and tell. This is my issue when people are like, can you come preach an evangelistic message? Not without talking about discipleship because if we're teaching people how to fall in love with Jesus, we don't have to tell them to go and tell the world. Come on, when I go and have a really good, yummy, juicy steak, I'm gonna call my friend Leah and be like, girl, you gotta go have this steak. They don't have to be like, look, we're, we're telling you that you need to go and tell people about our steak. If you love the flowers, you won't pick them. You won't pick them. And there's an ease that God is inviting us into around the idea of giving. When we understand the laws of sowing and reaping, we understand there's an invitation here for us to grow, not in our finances. Forget, I think that's going to happen. I, want, I do, because I believe in spirit, the laws of reaping and sowing. But I want us to think beyond finances. I want you to think about the reaping, the increase, the multiplication of his spiritual fruits in your life. And the Bible says that you've been given the fullness of love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And not all of us are reaping the fullness of it, and it might be because you're not sowing to the Spirit. And this is not a condemnation message. It's an invitation that says, if, if I love what God has done for me, if I recognize the beauty of the mission, if I recognize the beauty of the kingdom, then I'm going to sow and I'm going to find much pleasure in sowing. It's going to be easy. Come on, how many of you want giving to be easy? Easy. Like, I feel compelled to give. And so we are going to open up the altar. And I just really feel like, just going back to the very beginning, just that fresh layer of love here and recognizing that everything that God does in our life is, a, is grace. Everything that he does in our life is love. 
And so I want you to feel kind of the freedom around the idea and the concept of giving that, oh, this gets to be a, a love act. It gets to be a compassion act. It gets to be a gracious act. It's not a law act. It's not an act of works. If Look, if you feel... If you feel a law in your life, I'm going to say this on behalf of you. Please don't sow your seed into this church. Because this church is not being built on law. This church is being built on the spirit. It's being built on freedom. It's being built on liberty. And so I want you to feel that freedom today as you're reminded that in his presence, in his love, I'm free. I'm free to give whatever the spirit tells me to give. And so, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we just thank you, Lord, for just filling us with a a fresh infilling of his love. Come on, just let